This is Duke University. Thank you all for coming. This is great. Uh, I know it's that time of the semester when it's not easy to pull away even for lunch. I'm Jennifer Weisenfeld. I'm the Dean of the Humanities and also a faculty member in Art, Art History and Visual Studies. And um, this is the second workshop that the team, who you'll meet later, has organized. Um, and the panel, there will be two parts of this. One panel, which will be faculty discussing their experiences with major grants and major foundations. And then there will be a second part that will be related to, um, uh, that will be run by staff and all of the support. And you'll be surprised how many support people there are here who can answer specific questions and also can speak to what the resources are for you as you go forward and you want to look for um, different types of funding opportunities. Um, but uh, what I would like to do is just um, start out, and we've asked the um, four faculty panelists here to speak about specific grant experiences they've had. So I, what I'd love to do is just go really quickly down and have each of them introduce themselves and what disciplinary area they're coming from. And then we'll start again from Phil on down. And they'll each speak maybe for a few minutes about the, the grants that they've had um, and their experiences. And then we can kind of start in on some more general questions. So. Oh, yes. hi, everyone. I'm Phil Stern. I teach in the history department. I'm also the co-director of the PhD lab in digital knowledge, which is next door. Uh, and the grants I think I was asked to talk about here today are the, um, I was recipient of the Mellon, both from the Mellon Foundation, a Mellon New Directions grant and a uh, Mellon Sawyer Seminar grant, which is, uh, uh, will be, well, technically is online right now, but will have most of its activities in the next academic year. Uh, Ed Ballison, Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, Appointments in History, and uh, the Stanford School of Public Policy. Uh, and uh, I've had been a fortunate recipient of, of a number of uh, larger grants over the last few years. Uh, three I'll mention are uh, a cluster of grants actually from uh, Ford and MacArthur through the Tobin Project, which I was engaged with for, for several years. Uh, decent sized grant from the Smith Richardson Foundation to support work of the Rethinking Regulation Group here at Duke uh, that I ran for several years. Uh, and also a, a grant from the Teagle Foundation uh, that I was part of uh, around a, a, a teaching uh, set of innovations. Um, in each case, these grants were collaborative uh, with several other people. My name is Norman Wurzba. I am in the Divinity School and also the Nicholas School and a senior fellow at King Institute for Ethics. And I'll be talking about uh, my experience with the Luce Foundation. And I'm Walter Center Armstrong. I'm in the Philosophy Department at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. I also have secondary appointments in the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience and the Law School. Uh, and, and I think I've never talked about the Templeton Foundation yes. mainly, but I've also gotten grants from MacArthur and NEH Mellon and uh, Future of Life Institute, Social Science Research Council, a bunch of different places. Fantastic. So maybe we'll come back to Phil here, and we'll start with the, um, a little bit about what impelled you to apply for the two grants that you got, that you mentioned, and also um, what the process was, even working with Duke, what support you got, and um, the time frame also about it. Because we, we're really, uh, this audience is mid-career and beyond. And so we're really thinking about how this works with your career development and how you see yourself going forward versus, say, grants that are for first books. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's actually a really good point, something you have to sort of think about. And it's interesting, I got the Mellon New Directions grant untenured or at the cusp of tenure in the Sawyer Seminar. So I can actually speak to kind of thinking about that. The first thing I would say is as you sort of think about whether or not you're going to apply for the grant is to be extremely careful because there's a chance you might actually get it. Uh, right, right. Be careful what you be careful. Be yes. careful what you wish for, uh, which is not not the case, particularly for the kinds of. But but I think speaking to the issues that you sort of raise, which is to say that with um, great power comes great responsibility, and with great money comes uh, a lot of uh, you know, the obligations to actually sort of make something of it, and that thus timing I think is actually really critical. So the first question is, um, you know, how how what is the process? The process I usually follow is. 
uh, I receive an email uh, from your office or from uh, Beth or from Carol. I get nervous <laughs> that I should apply for this thing. I get very ambitious and excited about the ideas. And I apply for it and then we see what happens. Um, but I think the timing and the question of whether or not you actually have a good question to pursue and it, whether it's at the right moment for you to pursue it is really uh, important. Some things are unanticipated. I received my mail in New Directions grant and a month later found out that we were expecting our first child. Uh, so there's not always things you can anticipate lots for. Not lots, lots of new directions. <laughs> it's true they, that that was that was uh, we didn't budget for him as a, I'm frequently discovering every time the daycare bill comes. But um, but uh, but anyway, the, the 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 short answer is that I think um, uh, thinking about the term of the grant. Uh, Me the Mellon Foundation has been very uh, generous and flexible in a number of ways in terms of thinking about um, re responding to the needs, uh, the, the sort of intellectual needs of the project. I can't speak to a number of other foundations, but I can certainly say they're very easy to work with in terms of thinking about the ideas first and how the practical uh, 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 structure will follow <coughs> later. Um, so I think thinking about where it is in your career, the New Directions grant is particularly career specific grant in that it is, it, it's one that, that where you really have to be ready to make a sharp, sharp turn in another uh, direction and to be able to understand what it's going to do for the kinds of work you're interested in doing. Uh, the Sawyer Seminar, for those of you that aren't familiar, is a very different kind of grant. It's, it's really a grant for programming, mostly. Um, there's no time off or any, or any kind of, for one's particular research, but it's for, um, uh, for developing a faculty, and we've included graduate students in that centered year-long conversation. The one that we'll be launching next year is with um, a partner of, in, of Rachel Brewster in the law school on, corporation, uh, on corporate rights and international law and the intersection of those historically uh, and, and, and in the present. The reason I mention that is to say that also you can use the grants as an opportunity to think about solidifying or incentivizing connections across the campus that might otherwise be difficult to carve out of people's lives. Right? And Rachel and I know each other very well well, we're friends, but I think it's the grant that creates a space to allow for people to have conversations and structure to have those conversations that might otherwise be difficult to corral. You know what it's like herding cats or frogs in wheelbarrows or something like that um, to, to try to do this without. So, so you can think of grants both as an opportunity um, uh, for research and for carving out space research, but it also is an opportunity, I think, to structure relationships and conversations that you want to have and to incentivize those in some Respect, if that makes sense. Um, I, I do want to. I've been probably speaking for too long, but I, I should add that the process. If you wanted to be just so, so quickly, at least as far as this concer is concerned, very. Um, I found it to be very uh, efficient and streamlined. Uh, both of the pro Mellon processes I have uh, participated in involved multiple stages. Uh, what I really like is that no one here at Duke has ever asked me to invest too much uh, in. Uh, Applications that may not be forwarded, but but enough to give a sense of how uh, the, that work could be done. So oftentimes, at least, and this is the process I participate in, one will be asked for a pricey what the proposal is. It goes to a committee of some sort that vets them. In both these cases, Duke and with the Mellon Foundation, it seems to be the case that Duke tends to have the ability to nominate someone from the university. That may not be the case for a lot of other grants, for some other grants where you might be applying directly or you or there might be multiple nominees. So in cases where Duke is vetting the applications, I think it's really important, critical, to think first and foremost, and certainly from the definition, what resources at Duke one is leveraging when one is doing that. I don't mean financial resources, that can be a case, but in terms of intellectual resources, is it a good fit for here and, and, and for the kinds of programs that can be can be can can talk to this is certainly the case with the Sawyer seminar. And then after that I would just say there's been fabulous support, but I'll leave that for the next session. Uh, in terms of once you're selected there you get the surprise that your three page essay has to turn into a you know thirty page essay with a budget in about you know four days time or something like that. In which case you better be prepared to pull oh, the trigger. At least five. Uh, well <laughs> it's usually midday on a Friday. Um, but no 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 but 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 there's great support for that. I've never had I have no complaints about that. And this is probably something that most people know, but it's worth going on the record and saying that a lot of foundation grants are vetted internally because they require Duke nominations. So they're not direct. But that's not a across the board. Uh, but we do have people like Carol and Beth who are in foundation relations. And if you're getting something from them, chances are that is something that's internal. The Duke is vetting those um, and that we are we have a process. What's good about that is it means also that there's a pre-deadline and you can express interest and work with them and even float an idea and say, would this fit with this? Uh, that there, we, we usually have 
time built into that process, and they're willing to work with you and see if that's a good fit. So it's always worth communicating with them. Uh, it's not just a direct make your proposal, submit it, and it goes straight there. I would just add one of the things is that there have been other grants then this process is very useful as a kind of self-vetting, mm -hmm. because there have been other grants where there is a half-written Microsoft Word application on my desktop. And not that I ran out of time, but in writing the Precy, I realized it wasn't the right fit for me at the time or the moment, or I went to go do the sort of draft budget, and I didn't really know what I would spend the money on or something like that, and it wasn't. To me, that's a self-diagnostic, that not every opportunity is one you have to jump at, but you should jump. You can then have it to repurpose it. Uh, for later, uh, uh, for for later purposes, I suppose. Uh, so, uh, first, I'll just mention one thing about the types of grants that Phil has just referenced, which are the ones that have a very clear call and may have an internal vetting process before uh, the proposal goes outside. So, I, I get to work with this now in my administrative role. And we really work hard to provide feedback to those internal nominees. So, we give feedback as well to. You know, individuals who are not nominated. So we see this very much as a sort of pipeline development process. And, and uh, we also, uh, internally, have, there are moments, uh, as we did actually two years ago with the New Directions nominations, we, we saw such a strong pool for those uh, that we found internal money to support about half the people who had applied uh, because we just felt that, that, that the ideas were great and that we really needed to support faculty. Uh, and we were able to do that. So I want to stress, though, that uh, actually an awful lot of foundation grants are very different from how Mellon works. Um, and I just want to underscore the word relationships in, in a couple of different senses. Um, in order to be competitive for the kinds of uh, funding opportunities that many foundations provide, you really need to have developed very strong relationships with collaborators before you even begin to think about what funding opportunities might be. Because if you don't have a really strong team to put forward for the kind of research that you're looking, the pro kind of project that you want to get funding for, it's not going to be likely to be very competitive. Um, and this, the second point I would stress around this theme of relationships is, is the relationship that's crucial with program officers. Because many foundations provide funding opportunities that are not RFP based. If you don't have some conversation to start with a program officer, there really isn't, uh, it, it's not like there's an annual or biannual competition and then you, there's, you, so with that RFP, you put together the proposal. There are some like that, but there are actually many funding opportunities that are informal, basically, with foundations. And what matters is the relationship with the program officer. So this creates actually a very significant uh, barrier to entry that you have to negotiate. In, in my case, uh, the opportunities that came through the Tobin Project, which is a national organization, uh, and this is a series of grants that we got now almost a decade ago, um, I, I can't say that I played much of a, a significant role other than helping to really shape the ideas behind the, the collaborative effort. Uh, I was not the person engaging with the program officer at all. That was all happening through the Tobin Project. So having some type of intermediary, whether that's here at Duke or the people in Foundation Relations uh, or some other organization that you're part of can be really, really important. Uh, with the Smith-Richardson grant, which we received for a, a research endeavor that's about to culminate in the publication of a book in September called Policy Shock, uh, Recalibrating Risk and Regulation After Oil Spills, Nuclear Accidents, and Financial Crises. Uh, the crucial link there was that one of my collaborators, Jonathan Weiner, already had a pre-existing relationship with the program officer at Smith Richardson. And that is what opened the door to a set of conversations. I want to stress, however, that those conversations ensued. It took 18 months of conversations to get the grant. Uh, and, and that involved uh, hearing more and more about the ideas that we were exploring collaboratively and a very significant team. Uh, that ended up involving something like uh, 17 scholars from across the United States and several from Europe and one from Japan. Um, but it also involved uh, re refining our ideas and, and actually also being willing to engage with the program officer with respect to what his foundation was willing to support and figuring out whether there was enough of, a, of an overlap in the Venn diagram between what they're interested in and what we were interested in. Uh, to find the sweet spot for a, an application that they were willing to support. And we were eventually able to do that. But this was a process. And you, if, if, yeah, so I would, there are two things that I would just stress here. 
One is being open to really genuine collaboration with other people. If, if you're looking for this type of foundation grant just to support your own individual research, I don't think you're going to, in most cases, be successful. So there has to be some team and some organized structure that, that conveys uh, or that, that, that convinces a funder that, that they, they're going to be confident that you're going to be able to actually pull off what you're saying you want to accomplish. Um, and, and then the second part is just a willingness to really refine and, and to see that this is something that's going to be a multi-year process. It's, it's unlikely the kind of thing that you just have the idea for these types of funding opportunities and, and it, and it uh, then occurs magically without actually quite a lot of collaborative work. And I think for that I'll stop. So my, my story is a little unusual. I had received a loose fellowship to, to actually work on a very personal project that I had been interested in. And part of the procedure was that you come to loose to report on your work after the year. And I did that. And the program officer uh, at loose was very interested in the project and thought that it had potential to do some other kinds of things. And so about a month after that meeting, he called me up and said, Norm, I think you need to apply for a big grant from, from Loose. And I said, well, I'm not really very interested in doing that. I've got other stuff to do. <laughs> and he said, no, you really need to do it because the project is just inherently that important. And we think there's a really good possibility for you to do something creative and interesting at Duke. And so I put together about a $200,000 grant idea and sent it to, to Jonathan and said, what, what, does this work for you? And he wrote back and he said, no, no, you're thinking far too small and it needs to be something that's university wide. And he says, you need to at least think half a million dollars and you need to find somebody else at the university to make this a much more interdisciplinary kind of project, which was very attractive to me. And so I, I approached Jed Purdy in the law school. Uh, we had an existing friendship and share a lot of interests, and so I asked him if he would be a co-director in a project like this, and he said, sure. And so we put together a, a half million dollar project and sent it over to Jonathan, and he wrote back and he said, no, you need to go for a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and Jed and I were saying, well, we're not so sure we want to do a million dollars because we've got some very particular things we want to do. We want to host some kinds of conversations that we don't see happening in academic life very much, and we also don't want to just create a whole lot of busy work, but we felt the pressure, and so we, we wrote up a million dollar grant, and we had fabulous support. Uh, we learned very quickly that Keenan would be the place that would host the grant, and we got great help from Beth and some other folks, and so we put it together, and uh, we were sort of told by Jonathan that you know you don't have to actually run all the programs you put together that will total a million dollars, but we got some very good advice from, from some people here who said, well, even if you're not the boss on the name, you're still really the boss. And Jed and I said, this is taking us in a direction that we really don't want to go. We want to focus on a few key projects and initiatives. We don't want to do all the other stuff, and we don't want the hassle of having to administer it in our own heads, even if we're not directly doing that. So we wrote back and we're a little fearful and said, we really need to scale it back to about half of the million. And the program officer was fabulous. He said, I get it. And so he said, let's do it at $550,000. Um, so that's what we did. And uh, the thing that was, I, I'll echo Ed's point here about relationship. I mean. Luce gets hundreds of applications for this grant pool that our grant came out of, but there was this understanding that Jonathan had with me about the work that I do and the vision that I have, and he knew Jed's work and had actually met Jed before, and Luce has a, a relationship with Duke University, uh, and they know what happens here and how the interdisciplinarity that some schools talk about we actually do pretty well, and so they were really pushing driving the bus the whole way. And uh, we went along for the ride, and now we got to do the work. <laughs> so, it would be really helpful to know what grant and for what project. OK, so my, the, the grant I'm going to be doing with Jed is called Rethinking the Disciplines in the Anthropocene. So what we, we have two major dimensions. One is to work with doctoral students here on campus from across the university to get them thinking about the Anthropocene and their future research while they're still students. So we'll do some university-wide uh, seminars that will be 
available to folks. We'll bring in some lectures to the university. And then the other major component will be an international working team of senior scholars, where the aim will be for people from varying disciplines, from economics, philosophy, law, theology, whatever, to come together regularly over a three-year period with the idea that at the end we'll have a major conference, but then we'll also have a series of manifesto-type books. And we want these to be senior scholars because we want an economist writing to be taken very seriously by the economic guild <coughs> so that they see the Anthropocene really changes the way we think about so many fundamental questions. And that's really what this project is about. We think that the Anthropocene inverts many of the ontologies and methodologies we've worked with in our disciplines for a very long time and they need to change. And so what grant pool and within loose? So they have different initiatives. They have an Asian initiative. They've got public religious scholarship kind of life. And ours came out of this public theology kind of area. They're really interested on the kinds of projects that have not just an internal academic scholarly focus, but really reach out to shape conversations. So there'll be a variety of dimensions that will come with this project, not just the scholarly work and the teaching work we do, but there'll be a web page and we'll have writing that will be for a more general audience. And you know, again, Keenan Provost's office, they've been super helpful in giving us the support to do things that will exceed what the grant money itself will do. And Luce really wants to see university commitment to make a grant fly that they're going to support. And, and Duke was, I mean, it's been a kind of a dream to have the support we had. That, that outward facing feature is also crucial for most of these large grants. One thing I just wanted to say is that um, if you don't know necessarily what particular foundations cover or what their uh, current mission is, because it's shifting always, and Mellon has even shifting and pivoting towards new things. That's what the foundations, relations people at Duke can help you, uh, guide you to. First of all, we have a, a list here of major grants that's over there, and the, um, the staff will discuss that. But also, um, I think the nuances, they already do have a sense of some of these relationships, even if you don't have them yourself. And they can help guide you to what would be appropriate, or even help you think about your um, your idea and where it might fit in and, and, uh, and develop your ideas. The other thing is also that came up, I think, really importantly is a lot of us don't know how to think about budgets from this standpoint, what the scale is, because most of I, myself I could speak about is that I, I've only really budgeted for my own research to go places and do things, and so I know that scale, but I don't know the half a million dollar scale. I don't think I know the hundred thousand dollar scale. And so, um, and, and, and as the development people have told me many times, a lot of funders read from the budget backwards. And so that you really need to know how your budget uh, not only aligns with your project, but maps on very clearly to your project. You don't just create big buckets and say, well, you know, we're going to do this. Um, and that's actually an expertise. And so the people, again, the support structure that we have here can help you develop budgets that make sense as a narrative in relation to your proposal. And that's really important to know. And I, I, you'll talk about that, I think, later as well. And I'll just add one other thing. It is important to be talking to people that you want to pursue a grant or are pursuing a grant. Because Luce, for instance, has that as a policy that they will only give one grant at a time to a university. Right? So that was a real eye-opener to me. I thought, you know, anybody from Duke could apply, but no, it's just one grant that they entertain at one time. So other foundations may be different, but that's just something you'll want to know, and you won't know that unless you're in conversation with somebody in development. <laughs> can, can I just, can I just yeah, add one thing yeah. about, yeah, about the budgets, too, because I think, I, I wish I'd mentioned that that's a very good point, which is to say the budget is a story about what you're going to do. The budget is also a set of commitments. And I'll tell you from the other end, from the post-grant perspective, once your budget is in place, it is, and for a variety of reasons that aren't worth getting into that maybe you'll get into in the next session, um, it's it's not impossible, but not not very easy. You we're used as humanists to say, uh, here's a chunk of money, and you know maybe you pay, use it to pay for a summer or something like that. But you actually have categorized and, and, and committed money to particular kinds of enterprises. So forethought and planning is absolutely critical in what you want to use that money for and how you want to use it in particular ways. So I, I'll, let me add one thing about the budget before I go on sure. to uh, my spiel about Templeton. Uh, I think one thing that's very important is, is you don't want to be doing this budget line by line. You need somebody uh, who's going to do it for you. And often that burden falls on someone in your department. And so 
you really ought to check with your department chair and your department administrator to know that they're willing to take on all that extra work because it is a lot of extra work once, once you get the grant you know they have somebody they're doing a full-time job already and now all of a sudden they got to manage this budget and that can be in our case like you know, yeah. people coming from romania and you've got to figure out what kind of visas they need and how long they're going to be here and who you need to talk to and, and so it can get very complicated and take up a lot of staff time Let's just take a second because I think we both wanted to add something. You know, that's a really good point because actually, but that'll differ from some departments have more experience yeah. than other departments, and some departments aren't even going to start there. But Duke has a lot of support structure. Uh, Laura is, has been very helpful. The social, Laura Eastwood, sorry, Laura, <laughs> off camera. <laughs> Um, and the Social Science Research Institute, which has a massive grant um, management workshop, both for pre-grant, that is to say putting it in, and post-grant administration. So if your department is a place that doesn't have resources, or doesn't have expertise for that sort of thing, or doesn't want to develop expertise, because it could be that the department does actually, administration of the department want that kind of experience for their own professional development, may be eager to engage with it, there are some other reasons you should talk to these people about it. because And they can train your budget people to do this kind of work and um, because there is a, a computer system for inputting major grants and, and Laura Eastwood works extensively on that. And so we do have now, and we'll talk about it again in the, in the second section, pre and post award support. Um, so don't worry if you don't think your department may have the budget person to do this because we're thinking about that as well. We understand in the humanities traditionally people have not gotten really large grants and may be hesitant because they don't think their departments have this structure, but I don't want that to prevent you from thinking bigger and more institutionally about what you want to do. So, so I, I was brought here to talk about Templeton. I've gotten a number of different grants from Templeton, so I thought one thing that might be useful is just to go through the different ways in which I have approached them. Uh, but I'm going to be repeating a lot. That's the problem going last. <laughs> uh, so in, in some cases, I have just thought, here's some research I'd like to do. And then I've gone to Diane Masters in particular, is like God to me. She can you know, help me get what I want. And she will look through the different grant agencies and say, what about this and what about that? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then I get to do you know, exactly what I want if she finds the right person. Now, you might have to change it a little bit. So she says, oh, that project's interesting for Templeton. Well, Templeton only funds positive things. <laughs> And so if you want to do a grant study line, they won't do it. It's got to be on honesty, right? <laughs> so you might have to revise it and it. This drives some academics crazy. They don't want to you know, let the funders tell them how to frame their subject. But if you want to get the grant, you, they're given the money. You've got to do it. Um, so sometimes I've just come in with an idea. And with a little rephrasing, uh, you know, she goes into it. Uh, and she helps me find out where to get the funding. Uh, another source has been talks at professional conferences. Some of these funding agencies and foundations are now actually presenting at the foundation, at the talk, at the conference. I went to one at the APA, uh, the American Philosophical Association, and afterwards I went up to the person and I said, you know, you said you fund this, I didn't know you funded that. And they go, oh yeah, we're really interested. I said, well, I had this idea about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, four months later, I had a $2 million grant. I mean, because, you know, because I was there going to the session, listening to them and what they wanted. And you have an opportunity, at, you know, to talk to one of these people in person. It's well worth your while. To did you wear the killer tie? I did. I wore the uh, <laughs> uh, but it really is worth your while to go to public events and you know professional conferences where you contact these people. It certainly uh, has paid off for me. Uh, the third way in which I've gotten Templeton grants, I've gotten them in, in all these different ways, uh, is they have certain themes. They will, um, for example, in, in this case, they gave four and a half million to the University of Connecticut to study intellectual humility and civil discourse. Uh, and I said, well, I got this thing that kind of fits in uh, to that theme, uh, and so I applied. But I want to, uh, I want to second what Ed said. You know, working with the program officer is absolutely crucial. In this case, the program officer was a professor at the University of Connecticut who had gotten this grant, and then they make the the um, decisions about the school. So I was in contact over email 
you know, at least five times, maybe 10 before I ever submitted the grant, because I want to know what they're interested in and what they're not. Obviously, I don't want to end up doing a project that I'm not interested in, but the way you frame it, what you include and what you don't include can be absolutely crucial, can make the difference to whether you get the grant uh, or not. Um, and then uh, the fourth way in which I've gotten grants from gentlemen, because I just want to give the array, uh, is now you get to the point where they've come to me and they say, we want a project on this. Uh, and we've got you know, this amount of money. Actually, MacArthur did the same thing. We'd like for you to put together a proposal on this topic. When they do that, you know, your odds of getting it funded are really high, obviously. Uh, you still have to work with them, though, because uh, they're not going to give you carte blanche or let you spend their money however you wish. Uh, you've got, when you go into this grant process, you really need to have some flexibility uh, uh, about what you're going to cover uh, and who you're going to work with uh, and how big a grant. I mean, you may not want to go to a million, but they talked you up for 200 to 550. And so that kind of flexibility they appreciate and really greatly increases your chances of, of getting funded. So I know um, various people submitted questions, and a lot of them relate to very much um, nuts and bolts, how to do things. And so I think um, the staff is going to address a lot of them. But there were two things I think that we could discuss here. And then I'll open it up for additional questions. But no, we're going to get to your questions, and um, they're not going to be overlooked. Um, one was any tricks. Um, I mean, we've talked already about relationships, thinking about this over time, about um, developing collaborators. These are all things I think are pretty standard. But is there something, is there like uh, something that you learned, a trick or something that you thought, oh, I, I could never have intuited that? Or do you think it is really pretty straightforward in terms of? Uh, I guess I wouldn't think of, uh, I'll, I'll respond less in terms of a trick and more in terms of an ethos. Uh -huh. um, and I'll just come back to this public facing kind of orientation. Most, most grant granting agencies, uh, expect your project to have some wide salience. It's, it's unlikely to be just within a discipline. It's likely to be connected to some broader set of concerns that uh, are, are not, uh, that are about some aspect of what's going on in the wider society as opposed to just a, a, a narrower kind of channel within academia. So if you can't articulate that, in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, whether that's a, a, a pedagogical grant with a place like Tevil, which I actually didn't mention, could talk about that more if people are interested, uh, or a research grant uh, that, had, that involves a, a, a more capacious kind of research project, it's just not going to be compelling. The, the parts of the grant have to connect. You have to, you have to be able to get across what the stakes are and to show then how that all fits within the budget and then the, the budget narrative that goes along with it. And just related to that, I do think it's important, because I've seen this happen in grant proposals, that people think, well, this is inherently timely, therefore it's public facing. Oh, well, I understand. This is, of course, it's about disaster. I work on disaster. It's about disaster. Everybody knows disaster is ever present and, and relevant. That's not enough to make the argument for public facing, that it, it is inherently timely or always timely, because I, I think we might think, well, that's already different than may, maybe, say, some historical or deep archival research. And so therefore, it sort of speaks for itself. But actually, they're, they're thinking in a much more explicit way about public facing. And that has to be um, articulated not only in the modalities of how you're going to communicate the, re the research of the grant or whatever the grant is going to produce the product, but also um, in the types of activities you're doing and the people you're engaging. So are they public-facing people? Are they producing things that are public-facing? Are they curating for the general public? Are they producing podcasts? Are they uh, journalists? Do you have somebody in there who might have some expertise in that area? So it, it's, it's not simply enough to say, because the, the salience issue is really important, but then you have to take it a step further in st into the kind of implementation part. So, so then another corollary of that is disciplinary jargon is death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Can I just I think, add to that? Uh, yeah, a lot of foundations that I've known and worked with, they really prize interdisciplinarity. And that means something particular. You have to have a track record that shows that you actually know other people than just the ones in your discipline. And so you've already got relationships with people outside your discipline. But one of the things that our program officer, officer said repeatedly is we want to fund projects that are transformational and generative. 
And that means we don't want you just to pick up a conversation that's already going on. We want you in the work that you do to be creating new conversations that don't currently exist. And to do that, you have to be able to break out of your discipline. Right? I mean, not necessarily, perhaps, but it sure helps when you can show how the kinds of work you are going to do are going to be generative for new kinds of work, new kinds of insight, new kinds of discourses that currently don't exist. I think I'd also add to that that, I mean, this is all right, but there's this other unstated thing which maybe everybody sort of gets, which is that not only do you have to have those ideas, but you have to communicate them. So disciplinary jargon is death is a good tattoo to start with right on the forehead. But then after that, I think approaching one thing that I've learned in the process is that grant writing is its own genre of writing. And that um, depending on the nature of the grant, and sometimes you'll know this and sometimes you won't, the volumes of the grant, the sorts of things, these artful long introductions that we're used to, the anecdotes, these sorts of things that historians love, doesn't really work. You have to get to the point. And I, I wouldn't say much more about this because I think different projects and different grants and different foundations have different genres. And that's where the foundation relations people and, and, and others can help you. You. And, and also, I know it sounds ridiculous, but we have on file old successful and unsuccessful grants. And whatever to whatever extent they're available, that has been the number one helpful thing for me, especially even with budgets. What kinds of things have they funded in the past? What kinds of things haven't they funded in the past? That you can sort of look at. You don't mimic them, but you can use them to, to, great, to great effect. Uh, I think, so I think, think understanding that the, 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 the way you write the grant is a specific genre, genre and being open to being, even more so than your ideas, being open to be guided how you articulate those ideas, I think is, is, is crucial to success. And the other thing I'd add, and again, it's fairly stupid, it's pretty straightforward, but it, you'd be surprised how often I think in conversations with people, this is not clear, which is, is the grant right for the idea you've got in mind. So not only, you know, I like the irony that you have to lie to get the grant on truthfulness for lying. Wow. But, <laughs> um, Re -re reframe. I mean, reframe. <laughs> but, yeah, but, uh, I mean, the, 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 my problem isn't that one is lying. The problem is it's one of those catch 22s. How do you know how to do it before you get the grant itself, right? Um, but but the, there, there are some grants, and that's kind of where I was going, is two things. One is, what is the grant actually for? And is your project or your idea you know, so if you're not, if you're dealing with a kind of pre-existing program like I have, as opposed to these ones that that are born out of conversations, um, it does it fit really well. And the two grants I've got are mind-numbing in that they both seed something that isn't occurring and hasn't happened. One personal and one programmatic. And so you need to know enough to know what you don't know, and that can be a very uh, tough needle to thread. So thinking about, but that that I, to me is a. Um, a unique, or I should say, a feature of, of th that particular grant is where my mind was at that particular moment and time. And so being able to uh, to understand enough, but know that you also need to be go they 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 want to see growth and development and 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 and, and, and unanticipated un uh, uh, consequences. And how do you anticipate the unanticipated? That's a very tough genre to write to. Um, so I would add uh, one thing. Uh, which is that in addition to convincing them that <clears throat> you can reach out and that it's important and people are to be interested, at least with the Templeton Foundation, and I think with other foundations, you have to convince them that you know how to do it. And these days, that means you're going to use the web. Uh, you've got to, you know, if you write an article in a journal, then you're going to reach a few hundred people. If you use the internet, you're going to, you can reach hundreds of thousands of people. And they want that. At least the Templeton Foundation does, and I think other foundations do. So it's not enough to show that you can write in that language and avoid the jargon. You've got to know the means of reaching larger numbers of people so that your work can have a larger impact. And, and these days, that's, that's the internet. Articulating impact is also important. Articulating. And they actually, in, in the Templeton Foundation, they actually ask you to provide criteria for whether your grant has been a success. Like, and you can you go, this many hits on my website, this many citations of my paper, and so on. They or, really want to know that you're going to do that. Or funding for taking the findings of the research to DC or Brussels if, right. if yes. policy. Actually, makes. most major grants do have assessment processes at the end. So thinking backward from what your goals and your deliverables and your how you're going to assess your own success, short of thinking we, grow, we grew <laughs> in the process of doing it, is really important, measurable things. And even having um, 
some kind of formative and summative assessment midway. So you can do correctives is also really helpful. I mean, it's something we know from teaching, and it's, I think it's something that's helpful. E- Esther, did you want to ask a question? I, I kind of do, but uh-huh. I, I don't want to be the negative since we're not talking the topic. Part of this, and, and I understand this discourse of the, the big project and the, you know, the sweeping gesture and the new and the leadership and all of that. And that but I kind of have to comment, and this may not be representative of who's getting these big grants at Duke or more broadly, but there's, you guys kind of all look kind of similar, right? <laughs> and there's a certain subject position that is allowed more easily to have those big ideas and make those big claims and generate a million and be invited to up it to a million bucks and so forth. And I'm not trying to be flippant, but I also think that I'm curious what Duke has, whether this is representative of who's getting the big grants at Duke and what we can do to think about that and what we can do to both do the kind of successful grant writing that we're here to talk about, but also to think strategically about if there is a kind of structural situation in which certain forms of narrative and certain bodies that get to you know subject positions that speak that narrative will Nessus will be, you know, it's not just, is it great? I mean, it's those relationships. It's, I mean, if, if with the sort of business, you would have been on a golf course instead of on, instead of a, a, a think that's professional a conversation. No, I'm not, I'm not trying to be flippant, but I'm just saying those social structures, which are part and parcel of our professional work, still remain contaminated with all of the things that we no, and I don't want to, that's what I'm saying, mm. this could be an, 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 an accident, the fact that the four of you are who the four of you are, and I don't, I don't want to draw any conclusions, there may be information about it, but is there advice or is there information that, that, that the university has about people of color, about gender, about success in these kinds of positions of, of grant, writing these grant, grants, and how do we um, better both be honest and, and represent the kind of projects that we want to do and and have a different composition of who's getting it. Carol or Beth, do you want to address that? Um, as the person who invited the uh, the gentleman at the front, um, no offense, but I did try to have a diverse panel and I got turned down several times. Just that we wanted to have a little more diversity um, because we were aware of this issue. But on the other side, <clears throat> I wanted to say that the decision makers often at the foundations are much more representative of a diverse uh, population. So for example, um, at the Mellon Foundation, the, 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 the lead person who will be you know, making decisions about our next grant after uh, Humanities Writ Large is, is a woman. Um, and they have, they, they have uh, Mellon has just recently gone through a whole strategic planning process to, so that they have more of a sort of matrix organization. So they have their traditional sort of vertical integration things, but what is cutting across everything is diversity. So you don't need to bother to take anything to the Mellon Foundation these days unless there is a significant diversity component to it. Um, so I think that's in one case. I think, um, you know, and I think it varies based on, on the foundations, but there certainly are women and people of color in decision making capacities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can't comment on Duke's diverse faculty. That, that's a different issue, um, I think. But in I'm wondering if the PI, how the PIs, uh, in addition to having staff, I'm wondering how, if, you, if, if there's information about PIs for these kinds of big grants, if, if that's communicating into a diversity in the projects that are funded. I'm, I, it's a genuine yeah. question, I just don't know. Yeah. Um, it's probably a separate question. But I think it's an important one, which is to let's table the demographics of who right. the PIs are yeah. for now and assume at, at very the most optimistic that all of you are eligible to do this and whether and you're being encouraged to do it. If there's systemic reasons why you can't, then we want to identify those. But I'm not sure that that's really the case. And and so there may be other reasons, um, whatever those are. Can I also, can I also add, oh, sorry. I also just wanted to say that there are, there are several senior female mm-hmm. uh, faculty who would be just retired or couldn't leave this meeting. That's what I said. I'm really, I'm so, really not. I, I'm not trying to draw a full conclusion based on this. Can I address? Reasons. I really, I didn't mean it to be like that, but it is, a, it is part and parcel of the. But I want to address an underlying, a, a yeah. sort of an underlying question that was beneath it that might move the coverage in a slightly different direction, but it relates to it, which is that. Um, 
I think that some of the stories here are idiosyncratic to the kinds of personal, because your, your question about personal relationships and whether all these grants are being worked out at you know, Mar-a-Lago or not is, 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 is a valuable one, but I think it's a little bit idiosyncratic from the Mellon Foundation, from the perspective of my, I have a relationship with them to some extent because of the grants I've gotten, but the relationship is really Duke's relationship with that foundation. That's been my experience. Um, so I wanted to also mention that um, uh, you know, there, there, there is a sort of weight of responsibility with some of these grants, especially the ones where Duke has responsibility, which is your success and your following through is also also has an impact on the future people who apply. That was a sort of separate issue, but this raises the issue, which is that that in my experience, this idiot just as I don't can't speak to anybody else. My experience has been um, one of institutional relationship rather than a personal relationship in sort of shaping those grants. I, I don't sneeze in Mellon's direction without checking with Carol first, right? So, um, and so in that case, there is I think you asked about infrastructure and structure. So if it, it, the the issue would be I think with some of these other structural issues or diversity issues in terms of other things at Duke, but in terms of the grant aspects, a lot of these relationships um, are cultivated at that level, right? I mean under the umbrella of something, you know, I mean, the, so that's been my experience at least. So it's not, it, it isn't all, it, it, that, that's one pathway to I think address the issue. So, so, so another just. I want to make sure we get a chance also to hear a little bit from people out there, but you go ahead. Ed. Just, just quickly, um, you know, the, the Smith Richardson grant that we received, it's four of us who put the grant forward, two men, two women, mm -hmm. but, but enormous disciplinary diversity. Um, and so, you know, that that was crucial to the success um, of the grant. I, I would say that there's one underlying um, uh, pattern here that I think is also worth pulling out, which is that while we've had a number of very large grants within the humanities, not nearly as many as we've had in the social sciences or sciences over the last 40 years, and that's part of the push of actually trying to have these types of conversations. And and. And it's an implicit point that I'll now make explicit with some of my other commentary, which is that the kinds of collaboration and outward facing engagement uh, that tends to be more successful in the grant world, the larger grant world, is not something that many humanists have experience in. Um, there tends to be more individualistic scholarship in the humanities, and that, that's very important work. But it, Which it we're doing excellent. I mean, we're really, if you look across the board, the faculty are excelling in that capacity and, and doing in that realm. So that's why we thought this was a space that a lot of people have said, well, what if I do want to scale it up? What if I want to do something collaborative? What if I don't know how to do something beyond myself? And that was the impetus for this conversation. I probably should have said that at the, at the outset. But, but um, that does mean you've got to be open to working with other people and going in directions that you might not, might not, might not anticipate when you start. So, um, Jolie and then Anne Maria? I think I have a very similar response. I think not so much about, I mean, I, I will say the demographics, it's, it's not often these days you walk into all white men on panel, but so it, it's not that I, I was. I'm here, I'm about. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, leadership role, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I all of you saw, like, black. you know, the huge unevenness of the amount of service that women do compared to men, and that's also part of the story. But I, but I wanted to go back to this question of, like, I think we all came here because we want to think about how they get these types of grants. Um, and I, the narrative that um, I think all four of you gave, I think the last one a little bit to a lesser extent, was some version of. Um, I was passively there thinking really big thoughts and people came to me. And I networked using these really personal relationships um, to, to cultivate these grants. And I, I understand how those things work, but I think for those of us who don't see ourselves as a part of those networks, I, we feel a little bit on the outside. So it'd be helpful maybe to have practical suggestions about how to, situ how to access those kinds of networks that would make it possible to do the kinds of things we're suggesting. Absolutely, and I think that's exactly what the second part of this will do is uh, we understand that, and, and I, I certainly have none of those connections or networks as well. I think you have to work through the point people that we have here if you don't have them, and that's why we have this um, group. So I'm going to table that for one second, but I think it's really important. Actually, it was a, a response to, to Ed's comments and, and really to Journey's follow-up, which is that's exactly it. I mean, some of us who are either in the humanities or interpretive social sciences, which my theory will be moved over to the humanities <laughs> division in due course, um, have different sets of narratives to match up with the public facing question. And so I think to know the nuts and bolts of how that actually happens, 
also understanding that those of us in the humanities, interpretive social sciences, still have a responsibility for the monograph, the single narrative, right? So how do you negotiate those two things? And then finally, as I think about personally how to, to do public facing or outward looking work, it goes back to this question of the, of the relationships. I've been told by several different people, well, you need to get into Ford Foundation. And yet no one's actually telling me who I should go and talk to and how to go and talk to them. And, and so it is about those personal relationships. And, and so I'd really love to know, okay, so who can I actually dial up and, and talk I'm to? I'm glad you came because actually this is, again, um, what Carol will talk about. She will, uh, she has a relationship with, we have a relationship with Ford Foundation and with Actually, the provost and, and Carol went there um, and spoke with them just a few months ago. And so that's exactly right. And I think, again, um, we want to make sure that Duke as an institution has plugins for you to develop relationships. We don't expect that you're going to develop them on your own, or even that there's a, a mechanism to do that. And I, I just want to emphasize Phil's story just to remem remember that he replied to a call. He replied to a, an open call that was sent to everyone at, with an idea, and then the relationship developed based on the expertise in development and foundation relations. So this isn't about just pre-existing relationships. This is something that, that Duke can really help you with. So should we switch over to you guys, do you think? Or? Yeah. Well, several of you had to leave at 1 o'clock, yeah. so I wanted to be respectful of time. Yeah. Um, and we can have some questions at the end. Okay. Yeah, because I think that'll be helpful, and then we can we can revisit these these topics. I think they're all really important questions, and and we can continue to revisit them. But I, I really wanted to thank all of you for taking the time. I know <laughs> April's not a great time to try to take out, so thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. Ed, did you want to say something last thing? Yeah. So, so just one 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 last thought. I think that just to pull out another maybe more implicit dimension of of some of my earlier comments. I think there, there is a trade-off and a risk associated with trying to develop many of these collaborations. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, there, I, I think there needs to be a bit of a leap of faith for, for engaging with, with other people and exploring possibilities that may actually lead to dead ends. That, that's part of the process of, of developing a, a, a different way of thinking about problems or a different scale of work mm -hmm. that, that, and, and engaging with um, organizations that, that may not be right in your subfield or discipline, disciplinary channel, as a means of developing some of those relationships that then open up the possibility for funding opportunities. And there's no way, there's no way around that. I mean, it just is a, there, it's a risk that you have to take. And there is, a, there is some degree of a trade-off of just continuing to do the channel of your sole authored scholarship as compared to those types of endeavors. Well, and I think this is actually why this is a particularly appropriate conversation for mid-level to full professors, which is that you have more um, career, you have more bandwidth, and you also have more, um, it's just a time in your career when you can take some of those risks and it will be um, it will be valued in the next stage, which is not the tenure hoop, which has a very narrow set of um, expectations. And I can say, just having sat on APT, that I do think that, well, of course, there are the standard monographs and there, there's this intangible of impact of, um, of, how, of personal growth, of, of what you've tried to do in your career that is highly valued for that next stage. And so this is, it is an opportunity now that you have, you can catch your breath after tenure to really think about going forward in a more expansive and even risk-taking way, and that that can have. I mean, I spoke about this over the weekend about how sometimes something that doesn't seem to immediately have benefits in a conventional realm can lead to many benefits, including conventional publications, reputation, new contacts, a kind of level of, of, of visibility in the national and international sphere that you don't have now. So I just want you to think of this as a holistic career decision that can have a lot of benefit, even though it's not within the narrow channel of what you've conventionally thought of, which is what we've headed for with tenure. That's why it's a really different mindset post-tenure. That's really important to think about. I know we want to switch over, but I also want to say, like again, my experience seems to be very different. Than, I mean, no one has ever come to me and said, well, you've asked for 200000 but we won't do it for any less than $1.5 million. <laughs> this is not an experience I've had, and it's an experience I'm waiting to happen. Right. Um, which is to say, when, to the initial thing is that there are, there are, and I think this is where people like Joseph, where the Foundation Relations, um, 
there are grants at all these different scales. This has been my experience, and I think it's about trying to figure out which scale works for you and to not get pushed into. I, 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 was, I was joking, but I really do think there's a threshold at a certain point where the grants become very large responsibilities. We're trying to hire a postdoc right now, and the amount of implications of time that that took because it's in the grant. So you have to ask yourself what works for you. So if, if, if your career is heading in a particular direction, the grant can't derail that. It has to amplify it. And they exist at different price points, if you will, I think. So. And I'll just mention the Templeton Foundation has funded many people yeah, to write including Catherine Braiding as well, who's yeah. coming. You know, yeah. you, you reply, this is the book I want to write. They'll pay for you to get a year off. So there are agencies out there. And the Templeton Foundation will take your call. You just say, I've got an idea. You'll be talking to the program officer. So you don't need a network. But before you make that call, make sure you know them well. And, and, and it's always good before you make a cold call to say, what is Duke's relationship with this foundation? This is why I know people feel like development intercedes, but they do it to maintain the high level because everything that goes in represents us and that longstanding relationship. I mean, with Mellon, it's $40 million worth of relationship over 10, 20 years. So these are these, if you wait in that pool, you need to know what's at stake and where, you're, you, where you are in that process. And that's why we have expertise here that's different than simply being yourself. Um, so we'll do, we'll, we're going to try to address the questions that you've posed and any other ones um, that uh, you'd like in the time that we have available. Uh, so first, um, I'd like to introduce, um, well, first of all, I'm Carol Vorhaus. I work in the Office of Foundation Relations, and I specialize in the humanities and arts and the libraries. My office is divided into sectors. I know there's some people here from the social sciences. We have, I have a, a colleague who focuses on the social sciences, and that's sort of how we've um, broken things up. But let, let's start with Alicia Kornman from the Office of Research Support, who can tell you a little bit more about research funding at Duke, in case you're not aware. It's really a, a wonderful resource. Thank you. <laughs> What a nice introduction. Um, so this is the research funding website, uh, researchfunding.duke.edu. It's just a quick database um, to do searches for internal and external funding opportunities. Um, if any of you get the Monday, funding, Monday morning funding alert newsletter, that's generated from this website. And feel free to sign up. Um, under this resources tab, I'm just going to show you a couple of things really quickly. I'm sure a lot of you know this already, so I'm sorry. I'm just going to try to keep it quick. Um, there is a link to Pivot, which is a funding search database that Duke pays a lot of money to subscribe to. And that's a really good place to look for opportunities because it has worldwide opportunities. So again, for some of you who are talking about collab big collaborative projects, maybe you want to work with funders from other countries. Um, it also has a function that lets you save searches. So then every week you get an email with new funding opportunities that match your search criteria. So you're really being kept up to date on funding opportunities. And if anyone wants to sort of set that up on your computer, I can come to your office. You should all have my contact information. Um, another point of resource is there is a little bit, of, a little page here for Duke internal funding. That just has a few things right now, but one of the things it has is the online version, version of that spreadsheet. Um, it also links to all of the sort of current and past Duke internal funding opportunities that have been listed in this database. And the reason we leave the past ones in there is because they come around sometimes annually or every two years. And that way you can sort of be prepared like, oh, that's going to come around again. Because especially when you're looking at these collaborative projects, I know a lot of the internal funding is small pots of money, but they can really be the seeds of a big project. So you know, the vice provost for interdisciplinary studies, his office funds a lot of collaborative research. The vice provost for the art, the Franklin Humanities Institute, they all have specifically collaborative projects. And again, that just sort of, sort of starts these conversations in a small way. And if the conversations lead somewhere interesting, then you can look at these bigger foundations. Um, the main search, I'm just going back to the main page here. If you pop open this advanced search button right here, again, you can just do a simple keyword search in the top text box there. Or you can look for more specific things, again, arts and humanities, faculty, just to sort of see what there is. Again, you can look specifically for fellowships, grants, federal or non-federal. Maybe you're specifically looking for non-federal funding at this point. It also lets you search specifically by funding agency name, which is how if you wanted to sort of see, oh, what does Duke have for arts and humanities faculty? I actually didn't test this search, so, but I think it should come up with some. Okay, good. Nothing super recent, but some things. And again, it sort of gives you an idea. Oh, here are some of these smaller pots of money. 
but they can turn into something larger. And again, most of these come around every year. You can see a lot of things are sort of due right around now. But then here are some things that were due this past fall that are probably going to come around again. And again, if you want to further narrow these down, here are the ones that are cross-listed with social sciences, with environmental and life sciences, funding type. Those are all going to be grants. It's all internal. Um, if you want to sort of see, oh, I just I don't really care about internal funding. I want to know what fancy stuff is out there. Again, I just clicked Arts and Humanities faculty. So that will give you an idea of, again, and again, these... Some of these are institutionally limited. We talked about the internal vetting project. So when they have two deadlines, that means it's one that needs to go through that vetting process. But this gives you an idea of what's out there. And again, you can narrow it down. Oh, I only want to see the non-federal ones, whatever. Um, that's sort of the quick nitty gritty on how this website works. Are there any questions about that? And again, feel free to get in touch with me. If you want to set on a one-on-one -on -one appointment in your office, I can come to you and talk to you about searching for funding opportunities. I just want to underscore that the idea of signing up for searches to be sent to you is one of the strongest uses of any of these search engines because, you know, we, we only have so much energy, so we don't want to have to go back again and again. Having them come to you provokes ideas, helps you see connections. By the time a year has gone by, you've seen everything that funds in your field because it's all been updated. It's a great way to just have the information. I love that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I, I wanted to address another question that came up in the first panel, which is about sort of the, the scholar looking uh, to uh, finance their individual monograph. Um, one of the things that I'm sure you all have um, actually seen is that there, there is the hope through the new uh, strategic plan that's coming through, that there will be manuscript, manuscript workshops. It's not written down in any place else at the moment because it hasn't been approved. But I think there's, and Jennifer, you can comment, I think there's a very strong desire in, uh, uh, to have this come, come forward because it's been a well-recognized need that that's one of the hardest things, actually, to get funded. Um, and so there was the pilot at the FHI, actually, in these manuscript um, workshops um, and, and many grants were very, very popular and very successful. And so the idea is to that those will be continued. I can't give you any dates because it hasn't been finalized yet, but hopefully that will be coming in the next six months. And will extend to senior faculty as well. The idea is to make From who? available through the course of the trajectory. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to make those points quickly and then I would like my, the rest of my panel to introduce themselves if they just sent me this little note. <laughs> okay. Did you like this one? <laughs> um, I'm Laura Eastwood. I have been working in the Divisional Dean's Office for the last, this is year six of Humanities Red Large, which is a large development foundation grant. Um, beginning this year, part of my time is devoted to helping faculty working on other kinds of grants. Um, both on how do you get the project through the Duke system and out the door, and then once it's funded, what do you do with it to get it back in, to get it set up, to make sure it's properly managed, and then how are we going to close it out properly at the end. So I'm here to be an interface between the faculty member and the systems at Duke that are not designed for the kind of work we're doing, and so we're trying to work to make it easier and more streamlined than it seems when you look at it from the outside. Joseph, can I just ask you, as you introduce yourself, to also take one of these questions so that I want to make sure we sure. get through everything? Which one would you like? So one of the questions was, um, I'd like to learn if there are people who can help me shape a successful grant ah, yes. proposal as I write. So if you can talk about what you do and how we work together and sure, very good. Carmel, Carmel, who's not here. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Joseph McNicholas. I'm the Director for Research Opportunities at the Franklin Humanities uh, Institute. I am tasked with helping faculty shape their proposals in humanities and interpretive social sciences, uh, especially focusing on interdisciplinary work, collaborative work, uh, the kind of work that the FHI in general supports, uh, but working with faculty wherever they are for, for um, those kinds of grant proposals. Um, we function as a team, or as Trump would say, a well-oiled machine. Don't, 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 don't. Okay. <laughs> uh, much better oiled machine. Um, so 
I say that because if you want to approach a foundation, you could speak to any of us and we'll get you to the right person that you're having that conversation with. If you want to approach a federal agency, if, even if you want to approach a private individual, we'll be able to get you where you need to go. Um, uh, all of us can also help with shaping a proposal. My experience, uh, like Carol's, has been uh, primarily in humanities. Uh, your experience has been humanities and social sciences, uh, strongly. Um, so I would say we're like a great place to start. We can help brainstorm ideas. We can help figure out those network connections that you uh, need to make, as we discussed in the, in the last session. Um, we can help you build the budget and figure out what the story is, mm -hmm. how the budget and the narrative come together. Is it really reading, the, reading from the budget really is an important way to be able to approach your proposal. Yeah. yeah, that's often the way I start with the proposal yeah. too, is let's get the budget story right. Um, and just to underscore a point that's been made several times, all of us here in this room have the benefit of the network that is Duke University. And so even if we don't personally know the people, we're one degree of separation away from someone who does know the, know the people. So we, we can help you with that. And, and another, I want to stress a point that we talked about how do, how do we develop these relationships. And as been said, often the relationships are with Duke University. So checking with my office, the Office of Foundation Relations, or checking with Joseph, we can actually provide that information. So. Um, to the extent that we know it. So for example, someone had asked about who the funders were for the humanities and the, um, and the social sciences. And I have two lists, and you can, you can look at them, but I would say they're just lists. And I think what, you re what we really need to know to help you move forward is what it is you want to do, and then if it's a good fit for a particular funder, um, whether we've worked with this funder in the past. And, and I'm happy to share these lists. I mean, these are like the top, the top 10 I brought for the humanities, and I taught the top like maybe 30 for social sciences. But um, you know, we have all of this information, and we have a huge database that says who's working with whom, who the PIs are. Sure, we can pass that around. Um, um, I didn't bring lots of copies of the social sciences because I think that was just one person that was here. Um, I have a copy of the social sciences. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, you can have this one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but knowing, you know, knowing the details of your project, we can really help you hone. Hone, hone the the relationship. And as I said, we we work. Um, my colleague, colleague Alex um, de Havilland, Alexandra de Havilland, and I work together because sometimes the social sciences are pure social sciences. Sometimes they're interpretive, and you know she may be working with a particular funder more than, than I am. But we definitely, her desk is right next to mine. We we work together on these on these kinds of things. Um, but he, here's a good, good example. I don't know who it was, but somebody submitted a question um, that they were interested in fine art oriented opportunities and overseas grants. So. Something like that, I would say, call me because there, you know, that's not enough detail for me to know. Are you talking about fine, you know, fine art? Is it visual art? Is it material art? You know, what exactly are you trying to do? Um, and we do, we do work less with. Um, uh, this one happened to say Germany, um, but we know some. You know, we <sighs> international philanthropy. I'm sorry. Humboldt. Humboldt, right. But you know, the culture of philanthropy is not worldwide. So where it's highly developed in the United States, it is not as highly developed in a lot of other countries. So for example, I used to work with someone who was in the Netherlands and you know worked with the government to change the tax code so that they could begin to have a culture of philanthropy. Um, so it, it's highly variable once you go internationally, but we can try to we can try to help and identify things. Humboldt is is a good one depending on what you want to do. I wasn't sure whether this question applied to fine arts in Germany or whether they were two separate kinds of things. The fact is that. We're talking, you know, we're talking about sort of from them to us, but humanities really needs to, you know, the people who are in charge of development and foundation relations really need to educate the funders about why they should even think about humanities as something. And which humanities doesn't have, it's not like we're solving the world's problems, which is social science, or we're solving the problems of health, 
but we're going to solve the, you are going to come up with the legislation or something like that. And it seems to me there's a lot of, you know, both in, you know, there's a lot of, in the world of funding, it's really hard for the more purely humanities thing. That, and then you say, well, you have to become a new discipline there, but then you become an appendix to it. So the question is, what is the staff of foundation relations doing to try to increase using Duke's prestige, obviously getting the Mellon HWL off the bit, to educate them about what it is that humanities has to contribute? Because that seems to me to be the larger problem for strictly humanities people. Like I sort of, humanities, social science, more for social science, so it's not that as hard for me, but I do think it's a problem in the humanities in general, is that, you know, it's just, you know, it's like you come in with, you know, I don't know, political science, Stanford policy, law school, medical school, those things are obvious funding agencies in some ways, at least my impression. But these are the places where this good stuff that people care about is happening. To say I work on, you know, quote unquote, some obscure artist or something like that, you know, like, what's that have to do with that? Even though you really could argue that the humanities could reorganize the whole world, <laughs> Nobody can make that kid. It's not something you work from the assumption that they can. So, it's, so, so I have I have a couple of responses. Um, the first one is that there are sixty eight thousand foundations in the United States, and so often when you come to me and you have a particular project that you want funded, I actually go looking for the foundation that wants to fund that. Um, so that's that's part of what we're doing, which is that we're trying to match what you're trying to do with the funder that will pay for it. So that's one side of the answer. The other side of the answer is that I actually think that Dick Broadhead has made a tremendous effort to help, you know, nationally to under, you know, pe for yeah. people, all people, whether they're funders or not funders, understand um, the the need for the humanities and the need for funding in the humanities. I think that it is a difficult conversation. And I quite honestly don't think that my office is capable of carrying the stick very far. Um, we do have conversations with funders and we do ask them what their areas of interest are. But by and large, most foundations have a mission already. Um, and as we can, of course, we talk to them about, first about financing higher education, which is also a concern in some ways that we may see funding for higher education drop as well. So, that, so, so we do this in layers, but I would say that the other piece that I think is really important is that each faculty member needs to help make that argument as well. I think that we're, we're losing the battle with our students, we're losing the battle with parents, and we're losing the battle with the public because we have not made an effort in the way that we each should to make that argument about how vital the arts and humanities are. I think the challenge you guys are constantly every day. Every day. Um, so, so, oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, can I just add something because I have to leave, unfortunately. Yes. It does strike me that I wish I had had this session 10 years ago, mm -hmm. which makes me incredibly <laughs> sad, so thank you to you, Jennifer. But, um, so to just give you, you know, one particular slice of what's going on in this campus, so I'm in cultural anthropology. And the only people who do systematic grant writing, taught by faculty, mind you, are graduate students. Hmm. And the reason for it is because, partly because we're betwixt and between our disciplines, we're sort of understood as humanities and social science, but we don't do numbers, so we don't count, right? <laughs> and so, consequently, uh, most faculty realize it's just, it's, it's, it's just a crapshoot, you know, yeah. to apply for things. It takes a lot of time. And so the vast majority of faculty in, in my department rely on those drips and drabs from trends, mm -hmm. from you know, whatever comes down the pipeline, and then the rest they make up with um, whatever they have in, in their research funds, which can be very limited and limiting because most of us work overseas, and it costs a lot, even though we're just doing this solos and we're having some big grandiose multiple researcher uh, design project, it costs a lot of money. So um, all to say that as a consequence, and maybe it's the culture of the department, a lot of this is news. And mm. I can honestly say my own attempts to navigate the system of what's going on, Duke Research Funding, ORS, Foundation Relations, it has been completely opaque to me until Laura Eastwood showed up in our building. 
which I thank you for. But we actually could do with a roadshow into, into departments like cultural anthropology, AAAS, which is my other department, and, and some of the other departments. I, I would honestly say it would be incredibly helpful. Well, I would add that the, the, the other thing that all of the presenters shared today is that they're from large departments with significant staff resources, which as much as I really appreciate, Jennifer, you saying that there are institutional support opportunities it, it, those are still somewhat, can, I still don't know. I mean, I know that there are departments with people tasked to the administration of grants, and I think that that kind of information um, and an under, a clear understanding of what are the jobs that those folks can do to make this process. Um, well, most of those people are on the, on the post-award side, and our department does have to have that. With us, and that's why we've had such great luck with Wired getting all of those grants and managing those grants and all of the VSI. And, I mean, we, we have a resource person in our unit, so you should know that she's there for you, but she's only going to take care of the back end of it. And that's why we, um, we thought it was important to regularize Laura's role for everyone else to help them and to train up all of the staff people in other units, whatever size to learn how to put those into the, and to manage them, right. to, do, to do those kinds of management. And that's why um, Deborah Jensen right. took the initiative to hire Joseph on the pre-award side to help with preparation. The ideas, the initiative, where it fits in your career, how you're gonna use it, that's gotta be faculty driven. Yeah, I yeah, really think that's so important. I mean, I think you're right, we haven't had it until now, but I think where the pieces are coming into, into place right now, and we actually have a lot to offer, and I think the boundaries are now lower, and the walls are lower, so I, that's why I wanted to bring this to you. And well, I think that's why the session is really important because you know communicating what the, the, all these guys are doing and making you know make, it just sort of building that bridge between you and us. Even though I mean we know that you're there. I mean just even though I've met with a lot of you, I mean I I um, have never really just gone to like Carol, for example, and been like, what should I apply for, even though I'm constantly like feeling out for grants. Yes, yeah, um, I'm, I'm glad you're coming now to, to meet with people. Yeah. I, I wanted to share with you back on the advocacy question, something that, that probably most people uh, don't know, which is that uh, Duke has a presence in the National Humanities Alliance and um, has sent me a couple weeks ago to go um, directly persuade fac uh, um, the staff members of uh, Congress people, of, of, of our state senators, uh, and to articulate to them the importance of humanity research. Now, there it's about federal funding. Um, and uh, al although some people are concerned about federal funding drying up for NEH and NEA, uh, I'm not one of those people because uh, uh, the the Congress is going to put the money back. There's just no doubt about it. There is so much bipartisan support for those organizations. Um, so, uh, no, no, the, no. Really, there is. If, if you go to if you go to individual people's offices, they may not parade down the street in support of the NEH, but they're going to sign off on a bill that has NEH money in it. Absolutely, most of them will. Um, so. As, so I, I'm sure that money's going to come back. We were going to talk about um, uh, conservative responses in foundations to, to Oh, that. yes, yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, but before we go there, there's yeah. just one thing I want to say about networks. I know we're trying to wrap up here. Um, I think in the last hour, we have overstated the importance of networking, to be honest. Um, I've spent most of my career, about 15 years of it, working at the kind of institutions that don't have the built-in networks that Duke has. And we got millions of dollars worth of funding because we had good ideas that were well written and went to the right people. That's, that's a huge portion of how you get grants. Yes, the relationships are important, especially for some foundations. Um, and it's always good to stay connected. But a good idea, well written to the right people, is what gets funded. In terms of the political situation, um, I've recently heard from a couple of the larger foundations, the Ford Foundation, the um, uh, MacArthur Foundation and um, actually Mellon also mm -hmm. have said that they are leaving 
what they're calling white spaces in their budget. They're budgeting conservatively for the next couple of years because no one knows what our external environment is going to impose, and they're trying to preserve some flexibility. So, you know, none of us really have a crystal ball. Everybody's got an opinion. Um, but that I've heard from three different three different places, and I thought I'd share that. So thank you for coming. Um, we appreciate it. Any, you know, we're going to send you an evaluation survey. Please tell us. We can make this better, um, how to do that. And, and feel free to approach any of us. And call us. Yeah. That's right. If you've got a project that you're interested in, call us.